The information found in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hi, and welcome to the Women in Depth podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lourdes Fiato. Join me as we explore the inner lives of women, their struggles, fears, hopes, and dreams. We'll go beneath the surface and take a deeper look at what is hidden, unknown, uncertain, and uncomfortable. Hi, and welcome back to the podcast. I am really excited today to welcome a dear colleague of mine, Vina M. Wilson, to talk to us about a phenomenon, an experience that many women struggle with, and this is self-harm behavior. And this does happen with, um, with men as well, but for today's topic, we're going to be focusing on self-harming behaviors in women. Vina is a licensed clinical social worker who provides psychotherapy services to children, teenagers, and adults. She is the owner and operator of Honey Bee Behavioral Health, where she works to assist individuals and families in creating healthy, adaptive, and well-functioning relationships. Vina is licensed by the state of Nevada as a private clinical practitioner and is a state of Nevada Board of Social Workers approved clinical intern supervisor. Hi, Vina, and welcome. Hi, Lourdes. I am very excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me as a guest on your podcast. Oh, I am so honored, and you are so welcome, and I'm really glad that we finally made this happen. Absolutely. A long time in the making, right? Yes, but this is the perfect time. This is the right time. Absolutely. And I just also want to add, you know, I just, I should have mentioned this, you know, when I was introducing you, you know, you have been so helpful to me in managing, you know, little things that happen during, you know, a therapist day that you need to run something by another colleague, get some um, insights. And I just really respect and trust um, everything that you've shared with me. And I'm really grateful that I have you as a colleague to lean on. Thank you, Lourdes. That means the world to me. So today we're going to be talking about one of your many areas of expertise. Um, it was hard to pick so, when you were suggesting them, but I, I felt that self-harm is one of those areas that I think many people have misconceptions about fear and you know assumptions, and I thought this would be a really good opportunity to kind of get really clear on, on what this is, what it's about, why it happens, and also get some suggestions for beginning to either, you know, start the healing process or, um, you know, if you have a loved one to learn some do's and don'ts for supporting them. Yes. And I agree with you that this is an area that is riddled with lots of misconceptions, lots of negative judgments. And I am looking forward to dispelling some of those myths and providing a clear insight for our listeners today to have a better understanding about why people, women in particular, for this conversation, why self-harm is happening. So what drew you to this area? How did, how did you become interested in this or how did you come to be working with women who self-harm? It was by absolute accident. I had not intended to have this particular experience or dynamic as a niche in my clinical work with my clients. Early on in my career, I had the good fortune of working with a young woman who had several therapists prior to the time that she arrived to me. And the number one concern that she had was having overwhelming, painful emotions and how in spite of how much she tried to control her emotions, she'd be able to do it for a period of time and then she would have what she would describe as blow-ups. And her emotional blow-ups would create turmoil in her relationships with 
her family members, with her friends, and within herself. Like she had a tremendous amount of shame for her inability to deal with things and live her life skillfully and the like. And so as a result, she would self-injure. And what I mean by self-injure or self-harm, this young woman in particular would use sharp objects to cut herself. And her intention was not to die by suicide. Her intention was to relieve the emotional pain that she had. So me at the time, using all of the tools and strategies that I had learned up until that point, I found that nothing was helpful for her. And then upon doing some research, I learned about a particular therapeutic approach called or named Dialectical Behavior Therapy that was created by Marsha Linehan, I believe back in the 80s. And it revolutionized the way that people who experienced chronic thoughts of suicide and or continuous use of self-harm to manage their emotions, it really provided a wonderful technology for clinicians to be of support to their clients in a skillful, meaningful way. And so it sounds like from what you're telling me that self-injurious behavior, self-harm is a way to manage or contain overwhelming emotion. Yes, absolutely. Um, In this example, and I just want to qualify for our listeners that um, anything that we are sharing, um, you know, we've dressed up the details so that no client is identifiable, or we may be creating a client made up of different pieces and parts of different stories and experiences. So just that we are honoring client confidentiality. Just want to make that clear. So Vina, you shared how in this example, your client was using sharp objects to Mm self-harm. Can you share some other ways that um, individuals, women can self-harm? Absolutely. I'm mindful that for some listening to this episode, it may be a bit jarring or triggering or overwhelming. And in spite of that, I am happy to be speaking to you all about this topic because I think, especially towards the end of this conversation, knowing what to do and knowing what this is, is for our greater good. We have loved ones, colleagues, and the like who experience this sort of emotional pain and may use self-injurious behaviors to manage their emotional pain. So some examples of self-harm could be cutting one's skin with a sharp object or puncturing one's body, creating some tissue damage with the intention of alleviating emotional pain. Some people will physically hit themselves. Some people may engage in eating disordered behaviors. And some people may place themselves in very, very risky situations where their life could be on the line. Could you give some examples of um, what kinds of situations these could look like? Sure. So that could be having indiscriminate, unprotected sex with strangers frequently, right? To change their emotional state. It could be severe substance use. It could be walking down the street and just kind of choosing to walk into traffic with the possibility of someone hitting you, a vehicle striking you. That's a more extreme example and an example nonetheless. You know, this is really interesting because I did not know that self-harm or self-injurious behavior could look like some of these examples that you're sharing. And I, I, I mean, I've seen that. I didn't have the words. I didn't describe that as self-harm. I, I looked at it as, you know, self, putting oneself at risk or self-sabotage. I, I associated it actually a lot with my clients who are dealing with complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes. That's actually a big one. And I, and I have seen it in um, the high-risk impulsive sexual behaviors Mm -hmm. and, you know, substance use or taking something that they're not even really sure what it is Mm -hmm. and taking it anyway, something like that. Yes. And in spite of me expounding on this piece in our conversation, it's of no surprise to me that you notice those behaviors from individuals who experience or who have a complex trauma history. 
what we see, and this is not always the case, uh, I'll explain more later, typically people who engage in self-injurious behaviors or engage in self-harm more often than not have experienced some severe childhood neglect, sexual abuse, physical abuse, psychological or emotional abuse, some form of abandonment, reoccurring parental criticism, these insults to safety or these insults towards predictability of our environment due to biological factors, right? Like being very sensitive and being very reactive and then having a slow return to baseline. I'll explain that later. And then to have these environmental insults happen, put someone's emotion regulation system just at on high alert. And so for whatever reason, if that person is experiencing some sort of triggering situation and their emotions are amplified, the unpleasant ones, then there is an urge to do something about it to alleviate that emotional intensity. That makes so much sense because when I've been working with someone and you know, perhaps the presenting complaint or issue or concern that the person wants to address is very different from what it actually is. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. So you might have someone come in because they are really struggling with um, stress at work with a, with a supervisor. And so even with what they share and what they write in their intake forms, that's what you are starting with. And then you start to see that, okay, these tools for managing the stress, <laughs> the anxiety, um, it's not working. You know, and then over time, it is revealed that, wow, there was um, trauma and or if there was not any trauma. And when I say trauma, I'm referring to I guess what we generally assume is trauma. So sexual abuse, physical abuse, neglect. But then there's also a minimizing of perhaps a childhood that was safe in the sense that there was no physical, sexual abuse or neglect happening. However, the parents were absent. There wasn't attunement to feelings. So there were other things. And and it takes a while sometimes to really get to what the root of it is. And so I think it's really interesting what you're describing, that it does all, in general, track back to some kind of traumatic childhood. And we're really expanding trauma beyond what, you know, many people associate with trauma. Yes, absolutely. And your willingness to have the conversation about self-injurious behaviors in women is very timely. And, and I think the reason why this matters so much, just kind of piggybacking off of what you just noted we may have a client or we may have a friend who talks about how stressful work is. That We have these high stress, many of us, high stress, competitive work environments. There's also this social expectation in some areas. I'll just be broad and say social expectation to multitask and be quite perfect at it. Juggle <laughs> a million balls and don't drop one because if you do, then you're a failure. So sometimes if we are very sensitive and we're very reactive to our emotions, and it takes us a long time to feel better, and we have this history of invalidation growing up, or even invalidation from ourselves, because we end up taking on those painful statements that were made about us as kids. We end up taking that on and repeating it to ourselves, and we get pretty down emotionally. When we have these dynamics going on, there's a perfect storm to create emotional dysregulation. Now, when I say overwhelming emotions, I'm not talking about a bad day. I'm talking about using an example that was presented to me in my training. The person who engages in self-injurious behaviors or ha who has overwhelming emotions, their emotional regulation system is as sensitive as a third degree burn victim. And what's curious about our emotion regulation system and the way our brain processes emotions, right? Like no one can see it. And when I give you that example, you probably have the visualization of someone who suffered a burn injury and how sensitive to the touch and how painful that is. A lot of my clients who you know, have experienced the type of childhood, early years we've described, sometimes on the surface, they look really good. Like they have it all together. You know, and so I wanted to also put that out there. This probably goes in line with what we're going to be talking about later, Vina, with the myths that people who have experienced complex trauma or who are engaging in you know, these type of self-harm behaviors, they're not generally what you would think that that person must 
be a mess. Um, in fact, a lot of them are very perfectionistic. They're high achievers, um, and which adds again to um, like what you were describing, the pressure and the shame that they're not able to get this together, yet everything else in their life looks really good. Absolutely. It is a huge misconception, right? So when we hear someone like, oh, she cuts or she burns herself or she does this or she does that, the image that we often have in our head is something that is, it diminishes the capacity, the true capacity of that person. And I hope that that makes sense. Like, so what, what I mean when I say that is we picture someone who is totally not able to function in society. Like they are bedridden or they cannot come outside. Like the world is a big, scary place to them. And they're kind of like, and, and I don't feel this way. So please, audience, don't please don't interpret this to mean that I feel this way, <laughs> like misfits, like yeah, these people yeah. are misfits and oh my gosh, there must be something wrong. Right. Well, no, that's not the case. CEOs, lawyers, doctors, clinicians, store clerks, our baristas, all different walks of life, high functioning or qualified or whatever term you want to use. Those people can and do engage in self-injury. It is across racial lines, socioeconomic status, religious beliefs, and the like. This is not a phenomenon that just occurs to a certain person that looks and dresses and behaves a certain way. And I hope that that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It really does. And, and I don't want to get too much into the technical aspects of the, the brain science with this, um, Vina, but I just wanted to share a little bit and get your thoughts on this because I wanted to at least uh, give our listeners an idea of why these strong emotions happen, that, it's, that this is happening in the brain. And there's a reason for this because one of the things I've noticed when working with um, clients who with, with the complex PTSD is there's a sense of shame and anger that they can't get these emotions under control or why are they even happening or why am I in this state for so long? Because one of the things I've noticed is you can be in one of these emotional, um, what would I, what's a good word to describe? I guess emotional dysregulation or in Mm -hmm. an emotional flashback. It could be minutes, but it could be days. It could be a week. This is not something that they're able to easily pull themselves out of often. And sometimes, like you said, the usual things don't work. Yes. And then there's a sense of if the usual things aren't working, I must really be in bad shape. Yes. So there's some brain science behind this. And so can you share a little bit about it with our listeners so they can just begin to get a sense that, get a sense of what's happening to cause this emotional state? I'm going to simplify this to the best of my ability. So we have... We have a person and every human has an emotion regulation system. So the way that the brain um, processes emotional stimuli and um, that comes from our interpretation of events, whether they're happening outside of us or within us. So for example, kind of jumping back to the environmental piece, if we have the neglect or the abuse or the abandonment and we are biologically born to have a more sensitive emotion regulation system. So like sensitive emotionally, a big, strong reaction to our emotional experience and a slow return to baseline. Like baseline is just like feeling neutral, feeling balanced. When we have those three components on top of an invalidating environment, which could look like, just get over it. Why are you acting so weird about it? Just suck it up. You better not cry or pathologizing that person's emotional experience, then we have the perfect storm again for having very keyed up emotions. So when I try to practice just going for a walk and that's not enough, I then have shame and I begin repeating back to myself these, the invalidating statements that were made to me when I was growing up and I felt painful emotions. Why can't I get over this? There's something wrong with me. I must be weird. So we have this environmental piece of neglect, abandonment, or abuse. We have the biological piece of having a more sensitive emotion regulation system. And then we have the cognitive piece, right? The thinking piece, the harsh self-judgment. 
and I know all of us can be critical and the person with the sensitive emotion regulation who takes a longer time to feel better than a typical functioning emotion regulation system can really be on a loop of self-judgment and the self-judgment and the painful thoughts amplifies emotional stress. And then because of that, we have this action urge. You know, when we feel an emotion, like we want to do something about it. If I'm feeling happy, maybe I want to laugh. If I'm feeling shame, maybe I want to hide away. If I'm feeling anxious, maybe I want to do whatever it is that I do. When we have these very strong emotions, Lourdes, we have an action urge. It's important for me to know, note this really quickly, that Somewhere along the way in our development, no one taught us adaptive, skillful ways to manage emotions. And because we were punished when we expressed our emotions or no one just taught us how to handle it, we end up learning to self-injure. And when we self-injure, the brain dumps out some natural neurochemical that is like an opioid and it provides relief. So that's how that thing works. And hopefully I didn't get too brain sciencey. <laughs> You did not. That was great. That was wonderful. And I wanted to add something too, because I've done, I think there's three or four other episodes on the trait of high sensitivity, which actually occurs in 20% of the population. And I just want our listeners to know it's a real thing. People with high sensitivity, they've done research, a lot of research. And if this is something that's interesting to you, please check out the previous episodes. We'll put those episodes in the show notes on the trait of high sensitivity. And one of the things that they've noticed about brains of highly sensitive individuals is that we all have them. They're called mirror neurons. However, in those with high sensitivity, the mirror neurons, they soak up more. So what what happens with a mirror neuron is um, a person with high sensitivity, if they're observing someone who is in pain, or if they're observing domestic violence between their parents as a child. Um, Individuals with um, high sensitivity, they experience it. The neurons mirror the emotions, the fear, the anger. And so the person with high sensitivity, even if they are not the ones who are object of the yelling or the physical abuse, they experience it as if it was happening to them. And then they also have the four qualities for uh, people with high sensitivity Uh, One of them is depth of processing. So whatever's happening out here, a a highly sensitive person, they really soak it in. I mean, they just take it in. It processes more slowly. It's almost like a computer that has too many programs running. And so it takes um, some time for the person to to receive that, to process it. And and if whatever's happening out here is positive, it's wonderful. If whatever's happening out here is not so good, they also experience it very deeply. And one of the other qualities is a sensitivity to subtleties. And so people with high sensitivity, they pick up on everything and then they feel it deeply and they can't unknow it. And they carry that within them. And um, Julie B. Ellen, who is, you know, she's done a lot of work in this area, has like two or three books. She has, she works with clients globally with high sensitivity. I spoke to her and she had told me, and I thought this was amazing. I think she even did a blog post on it that for therapists, at least 50 to 60% of your clients have high sensitivity. I'm not surprised and I'm surprised. That is so curious to me. I have to research that more. Wow. Yeah. And the other thing too, that she told me that really made me go, wow, about high sensitivity. The research shows that if a person with high sensitivity is raised in an environment that is safe, supportive, encouraging, accepting, validating, this individual is going to thrive like no other. It's almost like you're, you planted the seed in super soil with the ideal environment and the ideal plant food. They're just <laughs> really going to, they're not just going to do well, they're going to thrive. And then the reverse of that is true. If a person with high sensitivity grows up in an environment that is not safe, not validating, not supportive, not emotionally attuned, mm. then it actually has a more deleterious effect on the, high, the person with high sensitivity than someone who is not. That's fascinating. Yeah, I thought it was too when, when she was sharing this. So I just thought of that when, you know, as you're describing um, how you know, self-harm, especially if someone is very sensitive, how 
this is um, you know, just that correlation, the connection you've made. Yes. And I appreciate you saying that because that provided additional support. It just, it reinforces one another. I appreciate you saying that. Now I get to research some new stuff. <laughs> yeah. If you want, just come down to my office, have a bunch of books. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, we mentioned um, a few of the myths, you know, one of them, you know, assumptions about what a person who uh, self-harms or self-injures might look like on the outside. But are there any other misconceptions that you feel are really important for our listeners to know? Yes. And the primary one is it's important for us to be mindful that people who self-injure are not necessarily suicidal. And I get how that could be our initial thought, like, oh my gosh, she cut herself or she burned herself or she did whichever potentially self-harming behavior, how that could look like a suicide attempt. And that is not necessarily the case. Many of my clients who I've spoken with, I am mindful to check in with them to see if their cutting behavior is or was an attempt to die by suicide. And it's been oftentimes stated to me that, no, I just felt numb and I wanted to feel something different, or no, I felt so much pain, I just needed to feel some relief. So I think that is the number one myth, at least in my world, that people who self-injure are suicidal. Now, that is not to say that people who have suicidal ideation don't self-injure. It's just been my experience that that is not always the case. And there's research out there to support that particular position. And so for any of our therapists, our clinicians who are listening, I think that really requires us to, to be very thoughtful and nuanced when sitting with someone who is sharing what looks like self-harm behaviors or um, if it's suicidal ideation, that there's a a very intentional process to go through because I can imagine that if a therapist responds to an individual who's self harming from the perspective that this is a suicidal um, ideation or attempt, that the therapist's response could actually do more damage. Yes. That is true, right? Because if, if a client is willing to disclose, and, and for many clients, many people, disclosing, you know, I engage in self-harm or I, I cut or I burn myself or whatever, that's already oftentimes shame-inducing. So if when that is revealed to a therapist and it is responded to or the reaction is, let me hospitalize you, you tried to die by suicide, that can cause a huge tear in the therapeutic relationship and then also reduce the likelihood of that person who disclosed to ever disclose again. Yeah. And I think too, um, beyond that moment, this person may also be very leery of even continuing in therapy in the future because of this, right? Absolutely. And so being hospitalized in an acute setting does not help the person who self-injures, it does not take that behavior off the table. There are some great therapeutic approaches to consider and research in order to assist your client in their ability to practice other behaviors to manage their emotions skillfully. You know, I think this is a good time to segue to, you know, the what do we do with this part of our conversation. And so I wanted to start with those who have a loved one, a friend, family member, significant other, who they are recognizing these self-harm behaviors. What do you suggest are some ways to support? And are there any things to definitely not do? The first thing that I would suggest to a person who's listening and they may know of a loved one who engages in self-injurious behaviors, When you find this out, and I know it's easy for me to say, practice regulating your own emotions. If you speak out of shock or overexcitement, that could cause a rift in the conversation. So when possible, if you can take a beat, 
go and regulate yourself and then approach the person and leading with curiosity like you know hey I noticed this can you help me understand are you trying to die by suicide leading with curiosity because their answer could be yes or their answer could be no well so then tell me how does this help you so you're not trying to die by suicide but I see that you cut yourself what were you trying to do what's going on I would say regulate yourself emotionally upon finding this out and then approach the conversation and then lead with curiosity. The thing I would say not to do, don't lead with anger because the person is either going to match your anger intensity or they're going to totally shut down. So leading with curiosity will help keep your anger and any other unpleasant emotion you have reduced. Edit. It will keep those emotions balance and regulate it. So once the person has approached from a place of curiosity, which I love that you describe it that way, because what I love about curiosity is when you're being curious, you're still connected to the person. Mm. You know, curiosity is connection and the person feels that you are trying to understand them. And when someone's trying to understand you, and you're not feeling any judgment or any anger and or anything else like that, you know, that feels really good. And we typically respond to that very well. So I love that you use curiosity as a descriptor for the energy of this conversation. So after the questions are answered and the loved one has a better understanding of what's happening, then what? I am a proponent of therapy and I'm mindful that we the person may not be in the space of where they want to go to therapy. I think the next step would be, of course, asking if the individual would like to go to therapy to at least learn some adaptive emotion regulation skills, right? And also there tends to be this, this situation or this dynamic of like, I go from zero to a hundred. When we aren't able to learn what our body does when it experiences a particular emotion and how it can graduate from one intensity to the next. It feels like we go from zero to 100. And sometimes maybe we do for the person with a very sensitive emotion regulation system who is not dialed into their emotional experience, their description of their behavior is zero to 100. So at the very least, learning how to manage their emotions in skillful ways. Also, if a therapist or someone can teach them how to notice the intensity of their emotions changing, in addition to ways to tolerate distress in the moment to where the action urge from their emotion doesn't lead them to do something impulsive, I think that that would be helpful. I, I'm sure that there are books out there. I know that there are books out there to teach a person how to do that. And I think that one would be best supported to receive clinical, intervent, edit, clinical intervention in addition to doing their research. So if someone is listening and this is resonating with them and they're seeing in themselves this self-harm behavior, what are some words of wisdom that you might want to share with them? The words of wisdom that I would have for the person who is resonating with today's conversation is you are not alone in your experience of self-injury. There's nothing wrong with you. You are not inherently bad. You are someone who would benefit from learning different ways to manage your emotions. Your emotions are not out to get you. You are able to create a life worth living and there are resources and supports out there that can be helpful to consider learning more about and practicing. Lavina, I thought of one more question as you were sharing that. I was going to ask you also, you know, for resources to share, but what are some do's and don'ts or suggestions for choosing a therapist? Because I think that's really important with this. Yeah, it is very important. And thank you for asking that question, Lourdes. Not being biased, I think that a clinician who has some awareness or specialty, whether that be 
DBT trained, dialectical behavior therapy trained with comprehensive, and the therapists out there will know what I'm talking about, but a very intensive dialectical behavior therapy orientation or doing DBT informed, like some elements from DBT could be very helpful because what makes DBT unique is the component of mindfulness, paying attention on purpose to your emotions and on purpose. So that way it reduces impulsive behaviors in addition to the clinician knowing how to help their client learn behavior modification techniques would be very helpful. That would be my first recommendation. I, in spite of me being trained in DBT, I still use psychodynamic process supportive type therapy And that sort of work is not the most effective for a person with overwhelming emotions who manages their emotions with self-injury. And what are some other resources that you would recommend, Vina, you know, as far as like websites or books or, or any podcasts that are out there? I can identify a variety. And what I will be mindful to do, Lourdes, is send that to you so you can add it to the show notes because that is a wealth of information. I will keep you here for an additional three to five minutes. So I would love for the listeners to be able to review it in the show notes. Yes, we'll definitely put those in the show notes. So if you're listening and you want to do some research, learn more, find some support for yourself or a loved one, you will be able to find that information in the show notes. Vina, thank you so much for spending time with me today and sharing your expertise in this area. I learned a lot. The one thing that really stood out for me that I, you know, I didn't know, I did not realize that self-harm, self-injurious behavior expanded beyond the cutting, the harm to one's body. And I'm a, I'm in the field and I didn't know that. Thank you. Yes, you're very <laughs> welcome. And, and thank you again for having me as a guest, Lourdes. I have to say, you are definitely a dear colleague of mine and a friend. And I have to just acknowledge you for being a wonderful source of inspiration. I started my private practice about five years ago, and you have always been a huge cheerleader for me, giving me so much guidance so much support. I truly, truly appreciate you beyond language. And I just, I'm thankful for you. Oh, thanks so much, Vina. I'm speechless now. I don't know what to say. I'm overcome. (laughs) (laughs) There's no language for it. (laughs) So thank you so much, Vina. I'm really looking forward to sharing our conversation with the world. Me too. Have a really great day. Hey, take care. Thanks so much for listening to the Women in Depth podcast. I hope it brings you a deeper understanding of yourself and others and that you found some insights that illuminated and inspired. If you like what you hear, please consider supporting Women in Depth with a one-time or recurring donation. Any amount is appreciated and helps us continue to provide free, quality content for the world. If donating resonates with you, you can find the donation link on today's show notes. You can also follow Women in Depth on Facebook and YouTube. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe on iTunes. Again, thank you so much for listening and see you next time.